I see lots of familiar faces, a few people I don't know. For those who don't know, my name is Mike Stone. I was on staff here up until the spring of this year. I've talked to a few people over the summer that didn't know I had left. So if you didn't know, I'm no longer on staff here, but I am back. Um, yeah, so we're going to be looking at a scripture in Acts here this morning. And we're going to be looking at the difference between change and transition. So we're going to look at Peter's experience of a vision of unclean animals that gives us a great illustration of this concept. So we're going to jump right into the scripture. It's going to be up on the screen. You can follow along as well. It's a longer passage. We're going to break it up into a few different pieces as we go throughout, but we're going to read a fair bit of Acts chapter 10 as we go through it. So if you prefer to use a physical Bible, your phone or whatever, you can do that, and it's up on the screen here as well. So beginning in Acts 10, verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and contained something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Now, to us in the modern day, this may not make sense. And if you're not familiar with the Bible and the Jewish religion, again, it may not make sense. But if you're familiar with it, you'll know that the Jews had strict dietary laws based on what God had given them in the Old Testament. So there was particular foods and animals that they could and could not eat according to the Jewish dietary laws. So probably the most commonly known one is that Jews don't eat pork. It was one of the animals that God forbade them to eat. There's different categories of animals and different reasons that they couldn't eat certain animals and certain foods. So this is part of their religious practice and what they were allowed to eat and not eat. So Peter, being a Orthodox Jew who follows the law, being commanded or asked to eat something that is forbidden by the law would be absolutely shocking. This was something he had lived with his entire life. He says he has never violated the law. He's never eaten anything impure or unclean. He has followed the religious um, purity and dietary laws given in the Old Testament. So now, this vision coming from God, saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat, it doesn't make any sense. Why would God be commanding him to do something that is contrary to the law? So the vision continues. The voice spoke to him a second time, picking it up in verse 15. The voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. So again, I'm sure if you place yourself in that situation, Peter would have been extremely confused. Why is God asking him or commanding him to do something that contradicts the law? This is something Peter has never done. Why would he be asked to do this? Now here we find the difference between change and transition. Because on the one hand, Peter could change his behaviors in that he could decide to eat something that he had previously viewed as unclean. He could go out and have some bacon, be tasty. He could decide to do that. That would be an external change, something in his behavior that he could or could not do. But it's much, much deeper than that. It's not like me just going out you know, to a Thai restaurant and deciding to order something that I've never ordered before because I'm not following a specific diet. That would just be picking something different off the menu. But for Peter, this is much, much, much deeper than what he's eating or what he's not eating because it's directly tied to his religious practice. To eat something that was unclean would be a violation of his entire faith, his whole Jewish understanding of how the world worked and how he was supposed to live out his faith. So eating something unclean would be a surface level change, but in order to do that, in order to understand what God is saying, he has to go much deeper 
to the idea of transition. Because change generally is something external that happens to us or around us or something that we do. It's an external behavior or a circumstantial thing that happens or that we choose to do. For instance, you might change jobs, but if you stay in the same career, Brandon being a teacher, he might teach at this school or that school. And it's a change, but he's still doing more or less the same thing, just at a different location. His life might stay more or less the same. He lives in the same house. He has the same family. He drives the same car. It's a, an external change in where he does that. But a transition goes much beyond the surface level of behavior or circumstances to what's going on internally. It's psychological or internal rather than external. It has to do with changing your self-concept or your beliefs rather than just your behaviors or what you are doing. So William Bridges has written on this quite a bit. He's got a quote that says this. Transition, on the other hand, is psychological as opposed to change, which tends to be external. It is not those events, but rather the inner reorientation and self-definition that you have to go through in order to incorporate any of those changes into your life. Without a transition, a change is just a rearrangement of the furniture. So Peter certainly had faced many changes. He had left his profession as a fisherman in order to follow Jesus. He had gone as a disciple of the rabbi Jesus, and he followed him for three years. So he changed his profession or his career. He had faced the death of his rabbi Jesus and then the subsequent resurrection of Jesus. He's faced many changes. He left behind his old path in order to move into something totally different. And along the way, the process of transition begins to happen in Peter's life. And though to this point his worldview has undergone some significant changes, there is more yet going on. And he's faced now with possibly the most significant transition he's yet faced. In being asked to eat something unclean by God, he is being asked to completely change his worldview, how he sees God, how he sees what Jesus is doing. Another quote from William Bridges says this, transition begins with an ending, with people letting go of their old reality and their old identity. Unless people can make a real ending, they will be unable to make a successful beginning. So for Peter, if he cannot let go of his old identity, his old beliefs that he is being called to challenge and change, he will be unable to embrace what God is doing moving forward. Because, you may know the story, spoiler alert, this isn't just about what you eat. This is not just about eating bacon or not. So it's impossible to take hold of something new when our hands are full of the old. If Peter's going to be unable to let go of the Jewish law in all of its detail, he will not be able to move forward into what God is calling him to. So let's pick up the passage again in Acts at verse 17, chapter 10. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, and we're going to go through a longer section here, so just feel free to follow along. The men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, so he's just had this vision, he's still sitting here trying to understand what this vision means. The Spirit said to him, that's the Holy Spirit, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. So the concept of the transition has been presented to Peter, but he does not yet know what is being asked of him 
or what it means. As it said, he's still trying to understand this vision. He's trying to understand what God is saying to him. And in the midst of this, these men show up with this seemingly strange request. So again, picking up at verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you're well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. Now keep that in mind. It is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Is there anything similar to the vision going on there? So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you have sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He's a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So this happens over a pretty quick period of time. It's just a few days that all of these visions and interactions are happening. And now the groundwork has been laid already in Peter's life for what is going on by his time spent with Jesus and the time spent before. But he hasn't fully understood to this point what God is actually asking him to do. The meaning as Peter is processing this and understanding it becomes clear. God is not necessarily literally asking Peter to eat bacon, but he is teaching him through that illustration that there is no person or thing or animal that God has made that is impure or unclean. So before this, because of, again, the Jewish purity laws, the Jews were forbidden to eat or associate with Gentiles. That is, anyone who wasn't a Jew, either by birth or conversion. Anyone who didn't follow the Jewish laws, they would not associate with them. So if, you know, someone was a Jew, they could not invite a Gentile family over to hang out and eat. They could not do that according to the law. So what Peter is now understanding is that God is saying, you are not to call anyone impure, meaning if a Gentile such as Cornelius the centurion invites you to come and hang out with him and preach the gospel, you go. You are no longer bound by the purity laws. You are to welcome even Gentiles into the kingdom of God. And that's the bigger understanding that God is revealing, is that now the kingdom of God is open to everyone. It is not exclusive to the Jews. The Jews are to invite in the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are to be welcomed as equal citizens of the kingdom of God without the restrictions of the Jewish customs that had been in the Old Testament. And Peter begins to understand this. And again, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around how radical this would have been for Peter because this was his entire worldview. He was raised as a Jew. He was taught from birth that you don't eat unclean animals. You don't associate with anyone who's not a Jew. Just imagine something when you've been steeped in that your whole life, told that you can't do any of these things, and now God is commanding you to do them. It's a radical, radical shift in worldview and understanding for Peter, not something that changes overnight. The behavior on itself might be easy enough to change. Okay, I can eat unclean animals. Okay, you know, I can 
go hang out at McDonald's with people who aren't Jewish. That might be easy enough to do on the surface, but the beliefs, the worldview that underlie that are much, much harder to change. And again, William Bridges says this, transition is not just a nice way to say change. It's the inner process through which people come to terms with a change as they let go of how things used to be and reorientate themselves to the way things are now. And new contexts call for new ways of doing things. And Peter has at least initially embraced the message that God has given and is prepared to make the changes and welcome Gentiles into the kingdom of God as he speaks to this group of Gentiles. This is something he would not have done before. He now goes with a group of Gentile believers. They're Christians. They, they, have an under, they follow God already. They had followed the Jewish faith to some extent, and he preaches the gospel to them, and many more people become Christians through this event. But transition is not as simple as making the external changes. And even as Peter has initially embraced this transition in worldview, he still faces challenges. So jumping ahead in time a little bit and jumping into Galatians chapter 2, 11 to 13, we encounter Peter again. But when Peter came to Antioch, this is Paul writing to the Galatians in one of his letters, but when Peter came to Antioch, I, Paul, had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong when he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers. Okay, he's eating with the Gentiles, he's welcoming them, who were not circumcised, as in not Jewish. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision, or being Jewish and following the Jewish law. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So, here we have Peter again, sometime later. He was eating with the Gentile believers. He was welcoming them into, but along come some hardline Jews who believed that you had to stick with the Jewish laws. So, they were willing to welcome Gentiles to some extent if they converted to Judaism and followed the Old Testament laws. So they're saying, we will understand that God is welcoming people who aren't of the Jewish background, but if you want to be fully welcomed and embraced, you must become Jewish. You must take on the Jewish law. You must do all that was required of people in the Old Testament. You must follow all of the customs of Judaism in order to be fully welcomed and embraced in the kingdom of God. And because of this, even though he had initially taken these steps, Peter takes a step back because he's afraid of how these people might react. Under the social pressure of this group, he takes a step back from the Gentiles, stops eating with them, stops associating them because he's afraid of what this hardcore group of Jews might say or do and how this would affect his relationships with other Jews who were in Jerusalem. And so he takes a step back even though he had initially embraced the transition and the change, again, it's not as easy as just changing your behaviors. And under this pressure, Peter takes a step back and no longer associates with people who are not Jews. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, who of course himself is Jewish, but becomes known as the Apostle to the Gentiles, he confronts Peter face to face, and I imagine this was not a pleasant conversation, and he calls him out publicly and says, Peter, what you're doing is wrong. You can't do this. You were eating with the Gentiles. You understood that God had welcome, has welcomed all people into the kingdom of God, but now you're stepping back from this. You're no longer following what Jesus has revealed to us. You're no longer following what the Holy Spirit said, and that all people are welcome. And Peter's fear that caused him to step back influenced other people who stepped back from what they knew God had called them to do. So Peter is between understanding the, tra the transition and fully accepting it. He knows at a surface level what God has called him to do, 
He understands what the behaviors are, and he has even embraced them for a time. But when a difficult situation comes along, he steps back into the old patterns and the old ways of doing things. And for us, if we're facing a transition, it is very easy when a challenge comes along, we have initially maybe embraced the transition and the change, but when a difficulty comes along, a hard circumstance, then we take a step back because it's easy to step back into what is comfortable and familiar, the old patterns, the old ways of doing things because that's how we've always done it. It's easy to step back into those things. And in between beginning to understand a transition and fully accepting, embracing it, and moving forward, we find the land of the quick fix. Esau Macaulay says, much of the Christian life is found in the middle place between initial joy and final consummation. It's precisely then that the compromises start to creep in. And for Peter, he compromised. He knew what God had called him to do. He had accepted it and was living it out for a time, but under social pressure from this group of Jews, under a desire to fit in with his people, because these are his people, this is his religion, this is his life, this is the way he has lived his whole life, he takes a step back, goes back to the old ways, goes back to what is comfortable, goes back to what he had known before. It'd be like putting on an old pair of shoes that you really like, right? It's easy. It's so easy just to slip back into those old patterns and those old ways of doing things. It takes no effort to go back to what he had been doing his whole life, whereas the change and transition was hard. It was not easy to do that. But again, without fully releasing his old worldview, Peter would not be able to accept Gentiles into the church. He would not be able to fully embrace all that God was doing. William Bridges says this, the transition process requires not only that we bring a chapter of our lives to conclusion, but also that we discover whatever we need to learn for the next step. We need to stay in transition long enough to complete this important process, not to abort it through premature action. And when we face a transition, this is not uncommon. It's easy to return to what is known and safe and comfortable. And Peter needed a stern reminder from Paul what he needed to be doing. He had to be called out publicly, probably extremely embarrassing and uncomfortable, and when he was called out by Paul, in order to return to what he knew was right and what God had called him to do. All of that is to say, transition isn't easy. Because you could look at the story, and it's kind of a nice, tidy little package in Acts chapter 10, right? Peter has a vision, the centurion comes along, he goes with the man, he understands that he's to preach to the Gentiles, he preaches to the Gentiles, a bunch of people get saved. Peter understands, everything's good. Oh, wait a second, I don't know exactly what the timeline is, but later on, he takes a step back from what he knew was right and falls back into the old patterns and ways of doing things. So it wasn't that simple after all. It took time. And of course, Peter took the rebuke to heart and he began fellowshipping with the Gentiles again and continued doing what God had called him to do. And he, of course, becomes the main leader of the early church. So he did get back on track. He did fully embrace the changes that God wanted him to make. But it took time it took multiple lessons, and it took him actually being called out by other people alongside of him in order to continue to understand what was going on. So how does this work for us in our lives? We all face change in our lives, but not every change comes with a transition, and that is fine. Not every change is meant to be a transition. Some changes are just external, right? You know, if you move from one house to another house in Kamloops, that may just be a change. It may not bring any kind of significant transition because you may have the same job, the same friends, the same social circles, the same daily habits. It might not mean any significant transition. But sometimes changes come with 
transition, or sometimes transition forces you to make changes. And I was thinking about how to illustrate this, and I was trying to come up with a story, and Michelle mentioned the Lord of the Rings. I thought, ha, perfect. There's got to be something good in Lord of the Rings. And Michelle mentioned Frodo. And so this is a good illustration of the difference between change and transition. Hopefully you're familiar with Lord of the Rings in order to fully understand this. But when you look at the story of Frodo, and particularly of hobbits in general, kind of their whole um, way of living is very quiet, small, and simple. Like they're literally small people right? They're like three feet tall. And their whole understanding of the world is small. They live in their quiet little corner of the Shire. They don't interact much with people groups outside of the Shire. They go around about their business, doing things quietly, and they don't really want to be involved in the big events of the world. They just want to be left alone, quietly doing their thing in the Shire. And that's kind of their concept as a people, right? We are literally small people. We're small in stature and we do small things. We're not involved in the, the big business of the world. That's up to the big people. That's up to the, you know, the elves and the men and all of those, you know, the grand kings and the people who are, are tall of stature and tall of activity. They do the important things. We just hang out here in the Shire. And Frodo, of course, being a hobbit, is of that mindset. He's a small person who does small things, who just lives out his quiet little life in the Shire. Now, when he comes across all of these events with his uncle giving him the ring, understanding that this ring is actually the one ring through his friendship with Gandalf, he is thrust into this um, situation of events, this flow of events that he had no idea about. And all of a sudden, he goes from a small hobbit doing small things in a small corner of the world to someone who's on this massive quest that literally shapes the destiny of the world. And this is not something that Frodo is comfortable with, right? Initially, he doesn't even want to leave his house, he, let alone, you know, going on this grand adventure. Most hobbits never left the Shire. Like, going five miles down the road was a big event for a hobbit. So on the one hand, he has to change because he has to leave his comfortable house. He moves, he sets out on this grand adventure, and initially he just thinks that basically he's just trying to get the ring out of the Shire just to a safer place, and you know, he can hopefully pass it off to someone else, someone who's bigger, someone who's more important. You know, at, at least initially, they're just trying to get it to the elves, get it to the men. You know, someone like Elrond, an, an elf, an immortal elf who's been around for thousands of years and knows big things, surely he can handle something like this. Gandalf, a wizard, he can handle something like this. The big people know what to do. I just have to do this, this initial task. I'll pass it off. That's it. I will go back to the Shire and live my quiet life as a little person doing little things. But as the journey unfolds and the various events of the road take place, slowly Frodo's understanding and self-concept begin to change. Now, I've read the books and watched the movies too many times, so I'm probably mashing them together in some ways. But I think there's two main things that happen that change Frodo's belief. The first is at Rivendell, where Frodo accepts that he may actually be the one to carry the ring. No long, because no one else can agree on what to do, they can't figure out who would be the ideal candidate for various reasons. Various people can't or won't carry the ring. They're unable to or unwilling to, or they would be tempted too much and know their own limitations. So it becomes clear that this council of the great people, the great minds of the era, the great heroes of the era, Frodo decides that it is possible that he would be able to carry the ring, at least for a time and to keep going. So I think that's the, f the first thing that happens to change his worldview, is seeing that he might be able to do this. He might be able to carry the ring. In fact, he might be the one who is supposed to do this. So he accepts his burden. He accepts that he is able to carry the ring for a time. And then the second thing that changes, even within this time, we have the fellowship of the ring. So again, although Frodo is the one carrying the ring, 
he is not exclusively responsible for because he is surrounded by this fellowship, this council, again, of great heroes, right? Astonishingly skilled warriors, people of great stature, great power, wisdom, physical ability. He is kind of in the center of this, protected from the external forces that are against him by this fellowship of the ring. All he has to do is physically carry the ring, and the rest of the group is carrying him to some extent. But another transition comes when they are attacked by the orcs at the river, and the fellowship is splintered. Boromir succumbs to the influence of the ring and tries to take it. The other members of the group, for one reason or another, are taken in different directions. Two of the hobbits are kidnapped. The others have to pursue them. So Frodo decides at this point, I have to actually take responsibility for the ring. It, not only is it my job to carry it, but I now have to take the initiative in doing something myself without the protection of the group. I'm not going to be surrounded by these heroes anymore. And he actually decides to set out towards Mortar by himself, which in hindsight, of course, would have been a significant mistake. He would not have made it by himself. Fortunately, Sam decides to go with him, and somewhat reluctantly, Frodo accepts Sam coming alongside him. So at some point along the way, Frodo's concept has changed. His worldview has changed several times from, I'm a small person who lives in a small area of the world doing small things, and the big things of the world are not for me, to becoming, well, maybe I could play a role if I'm not really responsible, to taking on the full weight, literally, and responsibility of the ring and attempting to take it to its destruction. Even then, as you know, he was not able to do it himself, but he was able to begin the journey and accept that he was someone who could try to do something big, that he might actually be able to have a role in the big events of the world. But he had to undergo several important changes in worldview. He had to undergo a personal transition from his beliefs that I'm a small person doing small things in a small corner of the world to believing that I'm a small person who could do big things that might have an impact on the whole world. The change was setting out on a journey, but the transition was much, much deeper. And if he had been unable to mentally transition or psychologically transition into a belief that he could do that, he never would have even attempted to set out by himself, uh, ultimately with Sam, to carry the ring to Mordor. He would have given up many, many, many times if he didn't believe that it was at least possible that he could do this. The original Frodo, who was happy doing his small things in the Shire, was not one who could have seen what would come down the road. I'm sure if you had asked him what would happen later, he would have said, no, that's not me. That's not who I am. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm a small person doing small things in my own little corner of the world. But he becomes someone who could do big things as his understanding of the transition takes place over time. So for us, in a time when we may not be probably faced with a situation where we have to take the one ring into Mordor, hopefully none of us, but we do all face change, we do all face transition, and those can be a variety of things, right? We can face a change of jobs, that could be by choice or not. We face death of a loved one, we have divorces, we have just life changes that go along, like having children, children leaving home and going to college. All of these things may bring significant transition with them. Not every change brings a transition, but some do because we have to change our concept of who we are. And it could be a something like grow, your children grow up and move away, right? I haven't gone through this myself. We've still got a few years left. But in talking to people who have, it's a difficult transition because potentially your concept has been, I am a parent who raises children. 
that may be your concept of who you are, right? It's my job, my duty to raise my children. Then, inevitably, those children grow up and they have their own ideas about what they want to do in the world. They leave home and go off to do various things. And now, all of a sudden, you're still a parent, but you're no longer directly responsible for those children. They are creating their own path and doing their own thing. So your own transition might be, now that I'm no longer daily caring for my children, who am I? If I'm not a parent with children in the house, who am I? What do I do? What is my purpose? What is my meaning, right? That's just one example of something that an external change, kids growing up and leaving the home, brings, but it may bring an inner transition of who am I? What do I do now that I have, you know, done what I needed to do and my children are off living their own lives? What do I do now? Who am I? Walter Brueggemann says this, two movements in human life are important. A, deep reluctance to let loose of a world that has passed away, and B, capacity to embrace a new world being given. And just as we saw with Peter, sometimes being in transition, a knowledge of a predictable and even successful past tempts us to stay where we are or return to old patterns rather than moving forward. We try to fit the new situation into our old way of doing things, which inevitably fails, or at least fails to move us forward. So if you're facing a transition, just a couple of questions as we wrap up this morning. If you're facing a transition, or maybe you can think back to previous transitions that you have gone through in life, what do you need to let go of? If the transition calls for an ending and a new beginning, what do you need to let go of? Peter needed to let go of his old understanding of how the world worked. Frodo needed to let go of his belief that he was a small person doing small things in a small corner of the world. What attitudes, beliefs, and patterns of thinking and action perhaps even served you well in the past, but you now need to leave behind? And transition is an uncomfortable space, so we often try to leave it as quickly as possible by doing something, taking action, jumping into the next thing. But if you are facing a transition or are thinking about transitions that you've faced in the past, how can you spend the necessary time in transition in order to let go of the past and be ready to embrace the next chapter? And Peter, of course, faced that. He initially embraced the transition, but stepped back into it and had to re-evaluate again and continue to move forward in the transition that he faced. And it took time, multiple steps, and multiple layers. So I'll leave you with those questions and that scripture, and we will close this morning in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for who you are and that you embrace each and every person, no matter where we are on the journey, Lord, no matter what point we're at, whether we're facing changes, transitions, anywhere in between, or none of the above, Lord. You face those things with us. We thank you, Lord, that you are up to something good in each and every person's life. And I pray just for those in the uncomfortable spaces of not knowing what to do, not knowing what is next, Lord, that you would embrace them. And just as you stood by Peter and called him to something new and taught him over time what that was, Lord, would you reveal in your timing to each and every person your purpose and your calling, what you are leading towards, what we might need to let go of, what we might need to embrace, what the old seasons were, and maybe what the new seasons look like in the right time. Lord, we pray this in your name, and thank you for this time this morning. Amen.